Welcome to the EEG Show, where you'll learn about the importance of EEG in the assessment of patients with various neurological conditions and the new research findings that are defining a new path for the utilization of EEG in the current practice of medicine. Hi all, welcome to another episode of the EEG Show. I'm your host, Kunal Sampat, Clinical Operations Director at Cerebell. Our guest today is Dr. Prasanti Govindrajan, Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Practicing Emergency Physician at Stanford University Medical Center in Palo Alto, California. Dr. Govindrajan is a health services researcher with expertise in acute neurological conditions, emergency medical services, and healthcare systems. The goals of her research are to improve access to specialized centers for acute stroke care through early detection of stroke in the pre-hospital setting. Most recently, Dr. Govind Rajan has served as a lead principal investigator for the BEST ED study, a cerebral-sponsored research program evaluating the diagnostic or therapeutic benefit of EEG use in an acute care setting. Dr. Govind Rajan completed her medical school training in India, emergency medicine residency at Boston Medical Center, Boston, and a fellowship in emergency medical services and pre-hospital care at the University of California, San Diego. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Govind Rajan on the EEG show. Hi, Dr. Govind Rajan. Thank you so much for joining me today on the EEG show. I'm really excited to have you on this show and, and talk about your experience as an ED physician and uh, what it means to have EEG in the emergency room. So with that being said, we can start. Our first question uh, was, what are the benefits of having access to EEG technology in the emergency room? Thank you, Kunal. Great to be talking with you. And, uh, you know, thank you for inviting me to the show. And I wish your show a success. And, uh, you know, so happy to be a part of the great work that's happening around EEG and, um, you know, happy to share my thoughts as an emergency physician. As you and the audience know, emergency physicians are the first point of contact for any patient coming in with life-threatening conditions and seizures is one of them. So broadly speaking, seizures are of two types. One where the body shakes a lot while the brain is seizing and the patient is altered. And the second type where the brain is seizing, but the body is not. So the shaking type of seizure is called the grand mal. And, you know, the one where the brain seizes, but the body doesn't shake is called the non-convulsive. And these are really broad, you know, two groups of seizures. And at this time, there really isn't a reliable bedside test to confirm if seizures are happening, if the brain is seizing when the body is not shaking. Clinically, when I look at a patient and they are seizing, I look at them and say, you know, this looks like a seizure, let's get medications going. But if they come in, they're confused, but they are not shaking, but the brain is seizing, there isn't a way for me to say if they are. So I think having, you know, a EEG would be great in the emergency room for that group of people. You know, some of the other conditions that I have seen, you know, low sugars, muscle twitching. Sometimes, you know, patients pass out and they start to jerk after they pass out. We call it myoclonic jerks. And if somebody sees it, they come and report them as, you know, I think the patient was seizing. So there are some where the, the line is not so clear cut, but you could say they were seizing or they weren't seizing. And it's really kind of helpful to have a test that can make that determination for us. And also, lastly, I will say that, you know, we see most of our patients who come into the emergency department, you know, with seizures, often our patients with, you know, first time seizures, they seize once they come in, and then we see them, we do tests, and then we discharge them most of the times if they're awake, alert, we just give them precautions and not to drive instructions and discharge them with follow up with neurologist, depending on the system they're in, depending on, you know, the social circumstances and all of that, it may take a while for them to see a neurologist, and then maybe even a few more weeks after they see a neurologist for them to get an EEG. So kind of really expediting diagnoses in those people would be good. And having a test really close to the event when it happens is important too, right? I mean, just like when you have a fever, you want to get an x-ray when you have a fever, not six weeks after you have a fever. So, you know, if you take that as an example, I would say having an EEG for that group of people would be really helpful too. Yeah. So I really liked how you explained, you know, the two types of seizures and, and we're talking about non-convulsive 
compulsive seizures. And uh, you said there wasn't like a reliable bedside test and EEG would be a great tool. So how are you currently triaging those subset of patients? So if a patient comes in and they, you know, we think they're altered, we do different kinds of tests because there may be many reasons why, you know, patients could be altered. Like I said, it could be because they have a low sugar. It could be because they have high fevers. It is be- could be because they have electrolyte problems like low sodium. So we check all of that. You know, sometimes people have infections and, you know, urinary tract infection is common in old people. So we look for that. We get a CT scan to make sure they don't have any bleeds in the head. And if all of that is negative, we just have to say this could be the only thing we haven't gotten a confirmation or yes, no answer is a seizure. And so we may start them on seizure medication and get them admitted to the hospital and have them bring an EEG, you know, tech to do the test when they are in the hospital. Hospital. Sometimes, you know, they may get better, they clear up and they may not need an EEG. But, you know, as far as an emergency physician goes, it's very undifferentiated early on. And so we do the best we can with what we have. So in terms of the breakdown, I don't know if you, there's like percentages, like benchmarks that like, you know, X percent of patients that come into the emergency room you know, are, uh, you know, non-convulsive seizures. Is there like a a metric like that, that you're aware of, or you keep track of? Great question, Kunal. I would have to go back and look at papers. I don't think we really have that number, at least, you know, in the population that I treat. It could vary quite a bit because it depends on, you know, the age, the demographics, the comorbid conditions people can, you know, patients have. So there is going to be a range. So I don't have a number for you, but I can tell you that, you know, it's not uncommon for patients to present with, uh, you know, altered mental state to the emergency department. I see. Is there a patient story that you'd like to share with the audience, uh, you know, where you performed an EEG test and it actually helped save a patient's life? Yeah. I mean, I would say I have had a couple of cases where I thought, you know, having an EEG would have helped come up with a yes, no answer that I kind of talked to you earlier about. So I'll give you a couple of stories and I'll, you know, there are different uses for an EEG in the emergency department. They're also kind of different in the application of an EEG, you know, to the clinical scenario, but I I will also be careful not to give too much patient-related info because I know we are trying to keep this safe and confidential and secure. So I'll try to focus more on, you know, the physical presentation, not so much about, you know, the patient itself. So one of the cases that I saw a while back was a young patient who came in by EMS. She was transported by EMS for confusion. She could not really share anything with me because she was confused when she came in. And so the history that I got from EMS was that she was on a bike. She crashed her bike into a tree. So, you know, the bystander called 911. They got there on scene. She was very confused, wasn't talking with them. She was just kind of staring blankly into space. And when they tried to transport her, she tried to run away from EMS. And so they chased it about 15, 20 feet, got the patient, and then, you know, brought her to the emergency department after, you know, some time talking with her about the importance of going to the emergency department. She didn't quite get it, but she didn't push back and she came to the emergency department and she was still confused when I saw her. So we did the test that we usually do, which is blood test, a CT scan. And although initially the working diagnosis was this could be related to maybe crashing her head into the tree you know, she had a pristine looking scan. So it certainly wasn't something that we would have treated, you know, there was no brain injury that was treatable at that time. And so, you know, the one other possibility was that she could have had a seizure and could have crashed, or she could have passed out. But the passing out wasn't something that we were concerned about based on, you know, the history that was given to us. So seizure was pretty high on our list. And so we got an EEG that did not show it. And then she cleared up in about 30 minutes or so. And so we felt comfortable you know, discharging at home with instructions and follow up. So this was, you know, a good example of, you know, at least making sure that she was not going home with a seizure. So I would say, you know, that's one situation that helped us kind of, you know, sort out the yes, no question. The second case was, you know, an elderly patient who came in 
and could not move the left side of the body. So we were all worried about a stroke. None of the scans showed a stroke. So we got an EEG, which showed that she was seizing. So we started her on medications and got her admitted to the hospital. So two different cases, two different stories, two different uses of EEG, but both happened in the emergency department. So, I mean, I don't know how much are you involved in the financial side of these things, but if there was an EEG test that, you know, if sites wanted to, or clinical sites wanted to use or hospitals wanted to use, what are like some of the factors you'd consider to make those decisions? Or what do you think is important from, at least from a clinician standpoint, to make it a worthwhile test? No, I think this is a great question because I think in healthcare, it's always important to kind of look at cost. That said, Kunal, I would not really try to put cost as one of the driving factors for what needs to happen when we are making a clinical decision for a patient with a life-threatening condition, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if that is you know, two antibiotics, one being more expensive than the other, you know, those are times when I probably would think a lot through about cost. But when someone comes in, they're altered, and we need a test to help us distinguish whether this is, you know, a seizure or not. And we don't have many choices. And there is one choice. And either you get it or not get it, I would probably favor getting it and not think too much about cost. I think I would worry more about the logistics. You know, for example, there are places that don't have a tech, uh, there are places that don't have the resources to get an EEG 24-7, in which case patients get admitted to the hospital. So, you know, it's really hard to kind of talk about cost in such hypothetical situations. But I would say, you know, at least early on, that should not be a driving force in deciding about, you know, making it accessible to emergency rooms or departments. Yeah, thank you for sharing your perspective on this. So with that being said, are you currently using uh, or performing EEGs at Stanford? So Stanford is an academic center. As you know, we are a center of excellence and, you know, we always try to bring individualized care. And as part of that, we were very interested in, you know, the EEG and bringing it to the emergency department. We do have inpatient EEGs that have been going on for a long time. We have techs on call. We bring them on if we need to. And as I said, you know, sometimes patients get admitted to the ICU or to the hospital and the techs come in, do the EEG and if we need to make a diagnosis. But we've also had that a resource in the emergency department. We are very fortunate to be able to, you know, provide that kind of excellent care and individualized care to our emergency department patients. Okay. And um, my final question was, what are the current barriers or challenges in terms of obtaining EEG tests in the emergency department? So once again, great question. You know, I've practiced in a few different places and I have to say the consistent barrier is being able to get it in a timely fashion right? The hospital has, in all of the hospitals that I was at, we had EEG, but bringing it to the bedside when a patient needs it in the emergency department wasn't something that happened, you know? And so I think I see that as kind of the the big barrier, you know? So I would have to admit a patient, I would have to presume that someone is seizing and start them on treatment. And then, you know, the test happens maybe in about six to eight hours when the patient is not in the emergency department. And then, you know, the decision to treat, not to treat, you know, happens. Ideally, you know, bringing it to the patient in the emergency department is, you know, one thing that we would be interested in. And also the resources, right? So to make an EEG happen, you need a tech who needs to be be on call 24-7. You need a neurologist who should be able to read it. So it's all of those, I think, that need to happen. And uh, I don't think all community emergency departments that have access to all of those in a timely manner. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's great insight. And just the way you put it. Is there anything else I should have asked what you'd like to add or share? No, I think uh, you know, we went through a pretty good list of questions and uh, I enjoyed answering them as a physician. And, you know, it's good to always do what's right for the patient. So always looking to kind of share our, my insights and what it needs to advance care in the emergency department. Thank you so much again for joining me on the show today. It was really a pleasure listening to you and you being generous with your time and, and sharing these insights. Thank you so much again. Yeah. Thank you again for the invitation. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today on the EEG Show. This podcast was brought to you by Sarah Bell. For more information and tips, visit our website at sarahbell.com slash podcast.